personal here for just a moment. <laughs> be honest with you, I, it was a time in my life not that long ago, and I never thought I would pass through that. And uh, in a unique circumstance, I was in the bank one day, and I saw my friend Terry. She said, uh, Unity Community Church of Blumberg needs somebody to fill the pulpit. Would you be open to that? For a son. And they invited me to come. And that turned into six months. And through that, another friend, Don Davis, who came to hear me preach, talked with Ruth Wade. He said, if you guys need somebody to fill the pulpit over at Pin Hills Baptist Church, you really get desperate. I might try 10 weeks. I don't think that's quite how he said it. <laughs> now I'm your pastor. Oh, praise, praise the Lord. Lord. Praise the Lord, yeah. Yes, I praise the Lord. <laughs> and humanly speaking, I like to give credit for praise. You know, all of us need in life people who just believe in us and are in our corner, even when we're not over. We all need that. Thank God. Okay, Acts chapter 2. We are in a sermon series, Acts chapter 2, Church 101. And we are seeing the formation of the church in Jerusalem, the first church of Christianity, if you will, from the New Testament perspective. And of course, today in our world, there are multitudes of churches. But here's kind of where it started as far as what they call the church age, right here in Jerusalem. And it really begins to result as a consequence of the sermon that Peter and the other apostles brought to the people in Jerusalem as they were filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And Peter ends his sermon, beginning in verse 36, that all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent. And that was our first lesson, that we need to turn from our sins and turn to God through Christ. Number two, and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, not ignoring the commission to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But because they had crucified Christ, now they are turning and claiming him as the Messiah, as Christ. So they're baptized in his name. So repent. Number two, be baptized. And then number three, it says, as they go on here, he says, repent and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so we talked about last week being filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's not so much that you get more of the Holy Spirit, but that the Holy Spirit gets more of you. That he moves into the driver's seat of your life, and you move to the passenger seat. And then, and with many other words, he bore witness, this is verse 40, and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Can you imagine? What a day. <laughs> Unbelievable. 3,000. Now, what we want to talk about today is church membership. It says there were added that day about 3,000. And certain Bible teachers and Bible students have held that that is the 
kind of the beginning of the concept of what we know today as joining the church or church membership. When I came as pastor of Pin Hills Baptist Church, I received a list of beautiful people, that's you guys, and it was entitled Members and Friends. And there are certain people who have actually agreed with the covenant that is in the beginning of the hymnal and the basics of belief and operation of this church and said, we want to join the church as a member. There are others who attend, participate, give, pray, are involved with Penn Hills Baptist, but at this point have not chosen to actually become a member. So we have members and we have friends. I want to make it very clear, first of all, this morning, that whether you are a member or you are a friend, you are family, as far as Penn Hills Baptist Church is concerned. And when I actually met with the church council for them to consider me as the pastor, I shared with them, I'm not so ultimately interested in how many members we have. What I'm interested in is how many participants that we have. People who want to serve the Lord with this congregation. So, members and friends, I must be honest with you. I don't believe there's an actual verse in the Bible that says you shall join the church. I'm not negating church membership. We'll talk more about that in a moment. I just want to make that clear. Now, why do some people attend a church, involved in a church, love a church, but have not chosen to actually become a member of that church? I'm going to suggest three or four reasons that I've come across through the years. I'm not talking about people who hate the church so they don't join. I'm not talking about people who have been hurt by church, so we're not going to join the church. No, I'm talking about people that love church and love a particular church and are involved with it. But they may not have chosen to become a member. Why could that possibly be? Well, for one thing, sometimes I've talked with people, they say, well, you know, I don't want to get hung up on a particular church or denomination. I just follow Christ. And I can appreciate that, but the Apostle Paul gave a caution in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He said, because there were some people who say, well, Paul baptized me, or Peter baptized me, or you know what, I just follow Christ. And what Paul's point was this, is yes, you follow Christ, but Christ uses people. So it's not just Christ, and I don't mean that in any negative way toward our Lord Jesus, but the Lord Jesus has given the gifts of people and ministries, and it all works together for the cause of Christ. Sometimes people have said regarding not joining a church, well, you know what, it's my connection with another church. In other words, I grew up in a particular church, and though I no longer attend there, I have a bond with that church. Maybe my family is still in that church. Or it's the church of my childhood. Or it's the church of a particular denominational bent, and I feel an allegiance to that. Now, I don't want to be like one preacher heard about Dr. Jack Hiles over in Indiana uh, years ago. Someone said, well, Brother Hiles, I love coming to your church. I would join it, but my mother's buried at that other church. And he said, well, dig her up and bring her with you. I, well, I'm not. We're, we're not going to suggest that at all, okay? But I can understand why some people have particular allegiance to a church of another uh, a denomination or a family connection, something like that. And they're attending and involved in a certain church, but they still have that loyalty in that sense to the membership of that church. Sometimes it's a matter that people will say, you know what, I love the church, but there's one particular interpretation that I, I don't agree with, and so since I can't totally agree with everything, I, I, I better not join, even though I support the church, love the church, appreciate the church, and involved with the church. And you know, I've had people come to me uh, through my years of pastoring different churches and say, you know, uh, Brother Tim, uh, you know, I want to join the church, and I'd like to, are you okay with it? But, but I have a little different interpretation maybe about baptism or the Lord's table or, 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 or when the Lord is coming back, something like that. And all I ask of someone is simply to say, look, if you can agree with the body generally of who we are, 
and what we are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Just do not have the courtesy to not promote in any way a, an opposition to whatever you might feel in particular about. Be at least you know, silently supportive of what we're doing here so that there's no division. And you know, I've had people join under those circumstances. They might see something a little bit different. I'm not talking about the fundamentals of faith, but I'm just talking about, you know, but they say, you know, I'll be supportive. And if there's something I don't particularly agree, I'm not in any way going to be publicly opposed to that. And I appreciate that. But that may keep them from actually joining the church. And then just, you know, there's some people, they're just not joiners. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes you go to a certain store, and you know, you get to the counter, you just want to buy your stuff. And they say, well, hey, do you want our, you know, our, our club card? No. Well, you know what? Can you have our, can we get your email so we can send you coupons? No. <laughs> and I go through about four no's. I just want to buy my stuff and get out of here. Okay? And, and so I tend myself not to necessarily be a joiner. And so for some folks, they love the church, they serve the church, they participate. When it comes to signing, shall we say, on the dotted line, they just say, you know what? I'm just not a joiner. Uh, and I love the Lord, I love the church, I'm going to be here, I'm going to support, I'm going to appreciate and all that. And, and I can certainly, to a degree, understand that. Now, so I want you to understand something. This is not a sales pitch to get you to die on, to sign on the dotted line about, about church. But why would be some reasons this morning, biblically speaking, why you might want to join a Bible-believing church? Well, number one, I would say there's illustration. You see, in 1 Corinthians 12, and verse 27, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, to the Christians there, and he says, listen, he said, you are one body in Christ and individually members of that body. See, the Bible gives the concept that all believers make up in a spiritual sense, not physically, but make up in a spiritual sense what we call the body of Christ. Oh, thank you. The body of Christ. And uh, i got to make sure I stay in front of that uh, program there. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, and that's going to be, we need a bigger uh, screen, I guess. But, uh, you know, the, the indivisible body of Christ, all believers, and yet we're individually members. And Paul, if you remember, we talked about uh, Paul giving the idea that, you know, we have one body, but we have different members. Don't we? We have fingers and hands and elbows and, and, and arms and legs and feet. We all have a part. And in reality, the local church is a representation, is a microcosm, if you will, is a picture of the larger church. And so just as all believers together are one body in Christ but individual members, so the local church can be an illustration of that. We are all one in Christ but we individually are members of that body. And so some people see the local church and becoming a member of it as an illustration of being a member of the larger body of all who believe. Another possibility is simply identification. And that's the idea that you are added to something, you join something, you belong to something because you want to be part of it. People join organizations, people join clubs, People join programs, people join lodges, and I can go on and on because they agree with the basic thrust of it and they want to be part of it. And so one way they demonstrate that and their participation is joining it. See, the Bible says here in Acts chapter 2 that 3,000 were added that day. And so the idea is apparently somebody or some bodies were tracking that these folks are becoming part of us, and these folks are becoming part of us, and these folks were becoming part of us. So there were a lot of people who weren't added, but there were people who were added. And so they became part of it. Now, whether you want to call that church membership or not, the idea is that they came together. They were added together as a group. Interesting. Jesus in Revelation 2 and 3 preaches seven sermons that John the Apostle records and sends to seven different churches. He says to the church in Smyrna, to the church in Thyatira, to the church in Laodicea, to the church at Pergamos. And these seven sermons were given to seven churches. 
Now, I'm sure there were a number of individuals who were, were believers in the church at Pergamos or the church at Thyatira. But the sermon is sent to those who gathered as a body, as a group, as a church. And so there's that connection. On the other side of the coin, in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 2, when you read the book of Galatians, it's not written to a particular church or like 1st or 2nd Timothy written to a particular individual. But the Bible says in verse 2, it was written to the churches of Galatia. You see, in that area of Asia Minor called Galatia, there were many believers in many places. And Paul says, I'm writing to the churches. So apparently in local areas, there were believers who banded together, bonded together, came together, joined together. And Paul says, here's a church in Galatia, and here's another church in Galatia, and here's another church in Galatia. Small groups of believers that had joined together. And so in some way, they had identified, they were connected together in Christ. And so Paul says to this group, and this group, and this group, and this group, who bonded and banded together in these various places, joined together, he said, I'm writing to the churches of Galatia. So identification could be a matter of saying, you know, I want it to be publicly known that I am joined with this group of Bible believers. Thirdly, it could be a matter of organization. You see, in Acts in chapter 6, as this church in Jerusalem exploded numerically, one of their ministries, like we're collecting the food pantry program, one of their ministries was particularly to widows. They didn't have the welfare systems and the governmental programs like we have today. And so they said, we've got to care for the widows in our congregation who don't have financial support, who may not have the food they need, the clothing, etc. And so they would have a daily distribution to them. But there was becoming a problem because there was some racial tension there. Jewish or, or non-Jewish believers were saying, hey, the Jewish widows are getting better taken care of than the non-Jewish widows within the church. And so the apostles came and said, listen, our responsibility is not to get out the groceries. Our responsibility is to preach the word and to pray and to lead you spiritually. So look out, seven people, we call them deacons. And they will care for this ministry. So there was a selection within this group of identified believers who had come together. There was a selection of seven. So you might call it an election of officers. In 1 Timothy, and I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians, uh, or not 1 Timothy, I'm sorry, I'm going to get it right here. In 1 Timothy in chapter 5, the apostle Paul says, Now, Timothy, regarding the church, he said, There are certain widows. And he said they've reached the age of 60. And they don't have a husband or a family to care for them. He said they are to become the responsibility of your local church. And so you see there was an organizational coordination. Whereby they said listen. There are certain folks that we need to take care of. Well who are the we? Well apparently people that have joined together. Had come together. Had banded together. Had identified together as believers. And they brought into them. It's not every widow that lived in town. Not even the younger widows of their own group. But widows who reached the age of 60. Who had nobody else to care for them. They are now the responsibility of the church. So what do we have? Election of officers. Certain ministries that are be to be coordinated. For those in need. These are all the ideas of organization. And even in our world today. If a church wants to buy property. Or a church wants to make a particular ministry. Or a particular decision. You see, we come together as identified congregants or members to make those decisions together so that nobody just off the street can come in and say, well, hey, we need to do this or do that. No, there's a process, an organization, if you will. And so with that in mind, it could be a matter of saying, well, you know, I join because I want to help live the organizational life of the church. And then it can become a matter of correction. You see, the Bible speaks of some correction that was desperately needed in the church of Corinth. The church of Corinth is an amazing church. I mean, they were filled with spiritual gifts. They were filled, apparently, with great spiritual leaders. But they were a very tolerant congregation. Too much so, the Apostle Paul said. Because he said, you even have someone in the church there. And he said, this person is living, apparently, 
in intimate relationships with his father's wife, probably his stepmother. And Paul said, listen, the pagans don't even tolerate that. He said, so don't be proud of your tolerance of this kind of bizarre and inappropriate behavior. He said, you don't judge people on the outside. 1 Corinthians 5, 12, you are to judge people on the inside. And so you see, it's not a matter. We see somebody out there, we call it in the world, that is acting bizarrely. But we might not be able to do anything like that. But when somebody who is inside the church begins to behave in a bizarre manner that is completely contrary to Christianity, to the Bible, to decency, then it is the church that comes together and says, listen, as the Bible says, you need to be out until you repent. Then you can come back in. And that's what happened, thank God, in that particular case. The fellow got it straightened out and he came back into the church. But there's a point of being outside the church. There's a point of being inside the church. And so biblical correction can happen within the context of membership. And then finally, it could be a matter of direction. When you join a church, in a sense you're saying, okay, I'm putting myself as a member under the leadership of the local pastor or elders of the church. You see, the Bible tells us regarding the elders, in this case, here uh, at uh, uh, Ben Hills Baptist Church, and I want to make it very clear, deacons are wonderful, but they're not elders, okay? And so when the Bible speaks of the elders, it's talking in our equivalent here of the pastor. And so I'm the pastor here. The point simply is this. The Bible says to the elders or to the pastors of the local church, it says according to Hebrews chapter 17, or Hebrews 13 verse 17, that the congregation is to obey their leaders and submit to them because it says they watch for your souls. And you know, for me, that's a pretty heavy duty responsibility to be aware that what I preach to you and how I minister among you and the direction that I encourage you is not only just so we can have a happy time here. But it's for the sake of your soul. Amen. Because the Bible goes on to say, I will give an account for how I tried to take care of your soul. And then the Bible goes on in 1 Peter chapter 5. And it says, again, to the pastor, to the elders, it says, shepherd the flock of God. That you've been given the oversight. And then Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Paul says to the elders of the church at Ephesus, the pastor there, he says, listen. He said, pay attention to yourselves and to the flock, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, which is the church of of God, which he obtained with his own blood. And so, in an official identifying sense, someone may join saying, I need to be under the leadership of a pastor, an elder, for the sake of my soul. Those might be some reasons why. Now, I want to conclude with some cautions. Number one, please do not confuse church membership and salvation. Some people think they're going to heaven because they're a member of a church. I can assure you, and I say this, I think carefully and honestly, there are probably church members in hell. It is not church membership which saves you. Jesus saves you. Whether you ever join a church or don't join a church, Jesus saves you. And you need to trust him as your Savior. Amen. He alone died for us, was buried, and rose again to give us eternal life. Jesus saves you. Now Jesus, as you follow him, will want you to be baptized. That I can't tell. 
Whether you join a church or don't join a church. But if you do join a church, you do want to join a church where they're preaching that Jesus saves. And teaching the Bible. Okay? But church membership is not a side issue. Caution number two. If you're going to join, please join as a participation. In other words, I know some churches and they are so proud that they have 500 members. And I'll say to one of the leaders, well, how many are there on a Sunday? Oh, about 85. What? You have 500 members, but only about 85 participants? Maybe a few more with people who can't come, maybe age or health. But generally, all these names on the roll. Friends, that's not real membership. Membership is the idea of commitment, participation. You don't join just for the freebies. You join to serve the Lord and serve the Lord together. So I'd rather have someone not join than join and not participate. I remember one preacher. They said, how many are you running at your church? He said, oh, about 200. He said, but we're only catching about 55. Maybe a point. And then finally, I've had people say to me, well, you know what? I'm not going to join your church because I'm looking for the perfect church. <laughs> and do you know what I tell them? Well, when you find it, don't join it. Because you're going to screw it up. <laughs> Guess what, brothers and sisters? There's no perfect church. There's no perfect church member. That's the grace of God. That he can take imperfect people who love his son and try to love each other. And he puts them together in an imperfect situation called a local church. But someday, we're going to be the church of God without spot and without wrinkle. That's the perfect church. Until then, we do the best we can Amen. by the grace of God. And you know what? I find that the good often outweighs the bad when it comes to the church. Now, I want to close with if you would decide to join a church, I'm not going to push PHBC, but you're here. <laughs> but if at some point you felt led to join PHBC, we have a celebration. Do you know what we call it? We call it from the Bible, Galatians 2 and verse 9, the right hand of fellowship. And that's simply where someone joins. I know, Heather, you recently rejoined our church. And it was a blessing as Heather stood there and to be able to reach out to her and give her what we call the right hand of fellowship. And we shook hands together. We partnered together. We bonded together. We're together in this. And you see, that comes from where Paul and Barnabas were going to minister, and Paul, I'm sorry, Peter, James, and John came to them and said, okay, you go to the Gentiles and minister, and we're going to stay here and minister to the Jews, but guess what? We're in this thing together. We're preaching the same Christ. We have the same goals. We love the same church, and so we're going to shake hands on it. The right hand of fellowship, that coming together, that was a sign of celebration, of agreement, of joining, of identity identification of part of participation celebration I've even been in churches where good night when someone joins the whole congregation gets up and gives them the right hand of fellowship and says man we're glad you're here amen we're glad you're part of us and so brothers and sisters just want to warn you if you join up at PHBC you're going to make us so happy <laughs> we not only shake your hand we might even give you a high five <laughs> Whatever you have peace to do. But the key is we join together, members and friends, to love the Lord, to love each other, and do the work of the gospel until Jesus comes to cause. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let's take our hymnal. And Jane, what's our song now? The family of God, 681. 681. I'm so glad. I'm a part of the family of God.